I'm delighted to have on the uh, show today, Nava Hopkins, who is, is part of my peer group. She is a PPCer through and through. I've known her for many, many years. I've known her through all the kind of iterations of various jobs that she's had in the past. Uh, and Nava's now currently the evangelist at Optimizer. And be, be, before we get too far into it, Nava, welcome to the show. Good to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. The moment you announced this podcast, I was like, this is the one podcast I really want to participate in because it's really fun to make fun of our bad decisions and then like what we can learn from them. So I'm, I, I'm delighted to be here and delighted to get to hang out with you for a little bit. A lot of the people that I want to have come on as guests are always like on the speaker circuit. So it's always difficult to try and compete with speaking jobs and all the travel that goes with, with speaking. Um, and I, I'd probably say you are there one of the more than most bets though, Jim, like, let's, let's be honest, like getting to hang out with Jim Bangs is well, that's very worth kind more than, than, than some kind of speaking spots. That is absolutely so kind of you to say that, um, again, I mean, like, so we've known each other quite a long time that we've done, we, we were both moderators of the speakers enclave, which is always yeah. a kind of a, a cool place to hang out and see what other speakers are talking about. So. So, so Nava, t tell us a little bit about who you are, where you're from, how long you've been in the industry. Sure. So, hey, everybody, Nava Hopkins. Uh, I actually started out in SEO in transition to PPC. Um, I always did a little bit of the Google Ads freelance because at the time when I got started back in 2000, you could just get yourself certified and take on clients. Um, I actually did that while I was in college because workaholism and ne ne waits for no one. Um, but what was very interesting is that my SEO trajectory started around the time the Panda and Penguin happened. And I had some very ethical quandaries about, am I happy here? So I ended up taking about a year and a half off from digital marketing and started a nonprofit called Angel Ed. Um, it's a failed nonprofit. It no longer works. But I consider that my non-MBA MBA. MBA because I learned pretty much everything what not to do, but also made a bunch of connections in the education space. So that would pave the way for when I would eventually start teaching more on the PPC side, um, the opportunity to connect with students and to empower them. Um, throughout the kind of in-between time, I was still doing some PPC freelance. And then I got the job at WordStream, which kind of put me in the SaaS mindset and really taught me that I love software. Um, and I ended up doing also a little bit of agency work, a little bit of in-house, but I kept coming back to software. And now in my role at Optimizer, I get to do what I love. I sit with the product team. I sit with the marketing team. I sit with the customer success and sales team and basically feed information in and then feed information out into the industry. So obviously, like, so again, I, I know Fred Valle is the, one of the co-founders of Optimizer pretty well. I've been an Optimizer customer more or less since the very beginning. Um, I always remember like they, they gave us a discount on our, um, fee for optimizer. If we gave them a testimony, I'm like, yeah, sure. I'll do that. No problem at all. Um, but again, I absolutely love the product been using it ever since. Um, and obviously Fred was a previously in a previous iteration of his life. He was an evangelist at Google, right? So it's quite yeah. interesting that you are now an evangelist at optimizer. So what, what has that enabled Fred to do more of that he wasn't doing before? Maybe you've taken off his plate in your role now. So it's really interesting. Um, Fred is, well, I like to, to, to think of Fred as he is the, the one that loves to sit and play with all the technical toys. Whatever is new and exciting, that's what Fred wants, wants to play with. And that's what he ends up building. I tend to be more focused around let's connect with people. Let's hear the stories. Let's, let's empower everything. And not that Fred doesn't love to do that, um, but having a second person who is a respected speaker, um, a respected voice in the industry frees up Fred to do more technical playing. So I can be out and about, but I can also then collect stories in, in a way that's actionable. Um, we do quite a bit of focus group work. We do quite a bit um, customer success testimonials, doing a lot of work also with empowering our clients just in general with, with their problem solving outside of Optimizer. So it's a lot of, I don't, I would say that it's, it's almost like how AI is not meant to replace you. It's meant to make you more efficient. Um, 
Fred still does a lot of what Fred used to do, but he's more efficient at it and he can do the things that he truly loves, whereas I get to do the things I truly love. Because he completely nerds out on AI and all that sort of tech stuff that, that goes on in the background. I think that was always one of my criticisms when Google first kind of launched. I mean, I always remember, I, I always say to people, I helped Google create my client center and Google ads editor, right? Because I gave them some use case scenarios of what I wanted to do. Because back in the pre-IPO Google days, right, they, they used to send engineers to London. We would sit in a room with other agency owners and we would share our frustrations of things it did and didn't do. Um, and they, they would sit there and make notes and write stuff down and actually action them. Whereas I think it's almost like we're at the point now where um, agency owners, people like myself and other people in our community, we're bitching about stuff that, that kind of happens a lot. And it's almost like Google just either, I say they don't care. I don't think it's the case that they don't care. It's just, they, they probably haven't got the, the listening beacons out to actually understand where this conversation is taking place. Um, or they've gone, well, we just know better than you guys. So we're just going to do things our way. What, what, what's your kind of view on that? So it's, it's interesting. I think the pre Ginny Marvin era, I would a thousand percent agree with you. Um, the fact that they put someone like Ginny Marvin in the product liaison role means that we all have someone that we love and trust and we know that she has our backs. She has the, the collective industry's best interest at heart. And for those of you that don't know, Ginny Marvin um, used to be one of the, the amazing forces for good behind Third Door Media and on the SMX group. So she also did a lot of account work. So Ginny Marvin is, is one of us. Having her at Google we all now feel more comfortable kind of checking our biases and, and asking questions. So for example, this is actually a, a real life example of Ginny Marvin at work. Um, someone posted that search partners um, opt out is going away, but the way they worded it, they correctly cited that it's only for PMAX that it's going away, but you could have very easily thought that it was going away for search as well. I was able to shoot a message over to Ginny and say like, hey, listen, what's going on here? Like this, this feels weird. Now, granted, I'm, I have, I'm in a special place. Um, we were on the board of the Pizza Association together. So we're, we're able to, to chat, but um, she was able to get back to me and say, hey, listen, I see the message. I see where it was confusing. Like, thank you for putting out the, the correction, but like, yeah, you, you are correct. I'll also chime in. Um, and so I think having the, 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 a person like that in that role is important, but I also think it's important that we check our biases. Um, I think we as an industry are so used to believing that Google is going to hurt us or that Google is going to do us wrong, that even when Google does something that's absolutely beneficial, we see it as hurtful because it's taking away our agency or it's taking away our control. And so I think one of the things that we could probably do a little bit better is thinking about what are the outcomes versus how did we get there? Um, and being okay with the fact that sometimes Google will do the right thing and also being okay calling out Google when Google does the wrong thing. And the same thing applies to all, all networks. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 not sure which guest I had on previously, but I was talking about um, some of the challenges that people had when they ran YouTube ads on their own or display ads on yeah. their own, right? And they had a horrible experience so they would ultimately end up going, I'm not going to run those. They don't work. When clearly with the right sort of strategic implementation, they work really well. They give you that kind of like additional um, inventory opportunity to give you that more, more scale on your campaigns. But I think mm -hmm. the, the, the challenge is that, that obviously Google introduced Performance Max as a way of helping, you know, to, to if you like, steer people towards the right way of doing the, the YouTubes and the GDNs and everything else. And I, th I think the people that, that, that are benefiting from Pmax now were probably the ones that had a bad experience with GDN and, and YouTube before, whereas maybe the ones that had a good experience with GDN and YouTube before are now going, well, we don't really like Pmax being there because all of a sudden there's a lot more advertising on the platform that wasn't there before that we're now having to come compete with. You, you will have a small window of opportunity where you can capitalize on things and then eventually the kind of system catches yeah. up with everything else. And I, I think that that's a really important point. They made what one of the the early folks in my career made the point that YouTube is the frontier. This was ten years ago. YouTube is still a frontier um, because we are all petrified of making videos. 
Um, so when a good YouTube advertiser has to compete with an average YouTube advertiser who's getting creative from Pmax, I think that's a really valid concern because it's driving up the cost of inventory. What I don't think is a valid concern is is saying that Pmax as a campaign is bad um, because Pmax helps the bad become average and in some cases can help the average become good. I still believe that exceptional, exceptional search marketers, exceptional, exceptional video marketers will create a better experience, a better sequencing and better and have better results if they use silent campaigns. But what Pmax does is it enables you to take your biases out of the equation and feed in information that, that you care about or that you're telling Google that you care about and then and run with that. A big caveat to this though, um, Mike Ryan and the, and the folks over at SMEC, uh, they did a study that looked at Pmax um, and they found that in order to have anything approaching passable results, you had to have at least 30 conversions, but ideally it was closer to 60 conversions in a 30 day period. A small business is not going to be able to do that. Um, and when we looked at PMAX over at Optimizer, we found that the lion's share of folks ran one campaign, one asset group. So when, when I talk about the bad becoming average, this is not to say that you as a marketer are bad, that you're not talented. It's just that you may not also have the budget to, to, fuel the, the campaign type that PMAX represents. So that's another consideration as well. Yeah. And, and again, I mean, I, I know we're probably going deep into the strategic weeds <laughs> on PPC, but I'm, I'm okay with that. Cause again, I'm sure the audience for this episode will be just PPCers, and that's fine. And those that don't do it, you should be doing it. But, um, I think the, uh, the, the thing that I always struggled with when, when PMAX first came out, it was like the complete black box, nothing was available. You couldn't, mm -hmm. you got no data couldn't see anything. It was just like you had to trust, trust blindly that Google were doing the right thing for you. Um, but you know, some of, some of that, um, some of those restrictions have been loosened now. So again, they're now, I know that, that Fred's come out with, um, with some new stuff in optimizer. I know Mike Rose is doing some great stuff with his, his scripts and, and in terms of some of the things you get out of Pmax now that you couldn't get before. So you can get campaign information, you can get search term information, right? There's still obviously going to be some restrictions in terms of what you can't do. Again, I, I, what, I'd love to get your thoughts on how you think things have evolved and if where we are in terms of that, that progress that Pmax has had. So I actually, for those of you that, that don't know, don't know me, those of you that know me, this is, this is no surprise. I'm, I'm very much a, a gamer. I love video games. Um, and I actually see this current era, specifically Pmax, as very much the video games and modding community. So I would consider Fred, Mike Rhodes, Niels, all of the scripters as the modding community. They're Steve Hammer, helping. gotta put Steve Hammer in there. Yeah, Steve Hammer, exactly. Uh, Steve, Steve Hammer, it goes in there too. Um, mod, modding out uh, the game or, or the, the platform. And then Google sees, okay, this is, this is consistently really useful. This is really, really important. All right, we'll, we'll consider breaking it in. There was a really good point, I forget who made it, that the modding community or the scripting community are essentially a free workforce for Google um, because they're, they're essentially telling Google what we as marketers want. But there's another side to that is, okay, we're showing Google not only what do we want, but this is where we're willing to build tools to, to mitigate the, these issues. So this is where... When people talk about why do you need tools, why do you need SaaS, this is where SaaS will always have a place because no ad network will ever build out everything. And if you try to compete with the ad network on parity, you're not going to win. Um, but when you look at it as what are the things that the ad network is clearly not going to provide and how can I provide value to my users? It, it's a great equation. But I also, I also think that the, 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 a lot of stuff that, you know, happens within Google, happens within Google in isolation, right? They don't know what happens in Meta. They don't know what goes on in Microsoft. They don't really understand all the other channels that people have got going on. So, you know, they can talk about what, what works for them in their, their ecosystem. Exactly. But once people step outside that ecosystem, that's where, again, SaaS tools that, that can combine budgeting across platforms, great. Agencies that can understand at a more holistic level what's going on for an advertiser and all of the money that they're spending in all the dis disparate channels, what they've got going on with SEO, what they've got with PR and, you know, um, 
influencer marketing and email and whatever else that they may have going on, that those are, those are things that don't happen in isolation. And Google can give you Google's view, right? But that's just their opinion on what's happening within their platform. And I think that's where SaaS and, and agencies really can, can add value. But I, but I do think there's another piece to this equation um, that AI you brought up earlier um, has, it came out at exactly the wrong time because it came out exactly when we as a marketing community were starting to be scrutinized for privacy because AI needs a lot of data and privacy inherently means that we don't get a lot of data. So a lot of the things that we complain about um, in terms of lack of transparency some of those are so that Google and all the other ad networks can be compliant with privacy regulations. So for example, um, I don't understand how this is true. Like I still can't quite pinpoint it, but the search term report lack of data is directly tied to them, to Google trying to be privacy compliant. Um, I respect the answer. I, I understand that that is the answer that we are given. Um, I don't, agree that it's that I get I see some search terms with, with zero impressions but I don't see things that that cost me money um but that that's a, that's a true consideration and it's a similar thing with Pmax I think that the idea of understanding cohorts of uh, search queries or the un, or understanding cohorts of audiences without being able to pinpoint this is the exact person is a result of Google and now Microsoft with their Pmax offering needing to be privacy compliant. And we as marketers need to know that we're not going to be able to report on exactly what happened with this person, exactly what every little thing that they did. We'll instead be able to report on this cohort of people seem to trend in this way. And that's that's going to have to be what it is. And there are some industries that have always behaved like this because of how heavily regulated they are. And it's just the rest of our, us now have to deal with it. Yeah, I mean, I'm... I'm um... I've always said I've got this kind of hate-hate relationship with Google. I hate them. <laughs> they hate me, but we have to work together so we just get on with it. But I, I always look at it, and, and now that we've got search term data in Pmax, my suspicions about the, the lion's share of the conversions that are happening for brands we work with are driven by branded search is coming true. So when you look at it, you can see that a lot of the conversions are coming from branded search. And you go, well, those probably would have come through anyway. I think sometimes the... The impact of like, you know, again, if it's an e-commerce business, the impact of having a product image can really help. And if the branded search term with the product image is what got people over the line, then you could say, well, if it was just the branded search without the product image, would it have got over the, would that conversion have taken place? So I'm okay with it. I think where, where um, I'm slightly uncomfortable, right, is, you know, again, I, I, I think that, um, you know, in, in the good old days, there was a lot of agencies that existed purely because they made all their money on branded search, which was incredibly cheap. And they were charging clients a lot of money for the sales that were generated from branded search. And you could argue and say, well, if somebody's typing in a brand, they're looking for the brand. So in most cases, that, that branded search um, shouldn't carry the same value. I mean, I, I work with a lot of companies that do subscription-based businesses. So Quite often, the, the kind of this, the way the, the consumers work is they, they will type in the brand name, go to Google. They've, they've already got the product. They just want to buy another something else. So they'll just type in the brand name, go there and buy. And, cl and clients don't really want to be paying to acquire their existing customer over and over again. Every time they go, they want to be paying you know $30, $40, $50 to acquire an existing customer. They want to be, be able to pay less. And even though you might say, well, Here's a list of all my existing customers. And it almost seems like Google, Facebook, and everyone else don't care. I mean, you can say, these are my existing customers. Don't show my ads to these people. They still do, right? So I will chime in. Um, Google heard this feedback and gave us a beautiful form that we could upload every possible negative we want to upload into those PMAX campaigns, any topics that we want to exclude, any placements we want to exclude. So I, I think this complaint about branded is fair and valid. I feel like they have created a solution around it. What I, what I do see, though, is that folks tend to build campaign structures that let them be lazy. 
Um, and that's that's where I get a little bit more frustrated. So, for example, um, I, I was working with a consulting client and they had branded not only mixed in with their non-branded terms, they had their the branded ad group had non-branded keywords in there. And they refused to do ad group level negatives. They refused to sequester the branded out. And then they were saying, like, look at all these results that we're driving you. Well, A, you're double, triple counting conversions. So we don't even trust your conversion data. Um, but the other problem is that if you don't sequester your branded traffic from your non-branded traffic, you're getting false positives and negatives about what your, your search terms cost. You're getting false positives and negatives about how good your ads are because if branded is driving it, it doesn't matter if you have an image asset that would be an image with it or not. It, it doesn't matter because branded, as you see, is going to convert better. So I, I do think it is important that we acknowledge how much the ad networks, not just Google, all ad networks are guilty of things that that frustrate us as well as things that, that are lovely um, are, are, are to blame, but also um, negligence on, on practitioner parts. And I, I don't love calling out bad actors and you'll never get me to say like this person is a bad actor, um, but I do see themes. And, and one of the big themes is what you were just saying about taking advantage where you tell someone that you're you're bidding on Google, but it's all just branded and you're you're driving a ton of spend and then you charge a percentage of spend. Like that's that's really not great. And then worst of all, agencies that hold accounts hostage, that you don't actually allow the advertiser to own their account. Um, there are some people that believe that they can't keep a customer unless they own the account. If Which that's the crazy. case, you probably aren't a good practitioner. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, like you, we are just there to help people achieve amazing results on the ad networks that we know and love. Um, we're here to empower our customers and to be their 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 evangelists and, and help them succeed. We are not here to hold them hostage with their company asset. Like that, that's just not great. Yeah, and it's it's funny in the, in the good old days, way back when um, Overture existed. Um, there was yeah, always yeah. two things that made me laugh. There was always the, what was, what was better than sex? And it was always like the search volume for sex would be compared with something else. So I always remember one month, David Beckham was better than sex because he had more <laughs> searches for, for David Beckham than there was for sex. The other one that always used to make me laugh is like, so, so Overture, their main kind of property was Yahoo. Um, and there was something like 30 million searches a month where people went to, um, Yahoo looking for Google. So they typed in Google. So they went to Yahoo, typed in Google, saw the link, clicked to Google and sent them across to their, their site. But the, the point I was going to make to, to, to your point about the bad actors. So way back in the day when it, when, you know, you could buy a keyword for like two cents or one cent or something like that. Um, there was a company here in the UK that, that basically created a model where they would go and see a small local business, right. And basically guarantee them that they would, they would show up on the the search results right on yahoo so they would say, all you have to do. yeah and 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 basically they they would choose the keywords so i think one of the keywords that they they chose i think it was a, a business in something let, let's, let's say it was uh, newcastle so it would be specialist cheese in newcastle right so you and i both know that that the number of searches for that term every month would probably be about six and more often than not those six searches would be the brand looking for themselves that, that would be the number of people looking for that term. But this company was charging £1,000 a year for that term, which probably in realistic terms only cost them as an agency about pounds. £3, something like that. So incredibly cheap. So the margin or profit margin for the agency, huge. You know, the value for the business, non-existence, like, bit, bit like the Emperor's New Clothes, completely worthless, no value, but ultimately somebody capitalizing on the market kind of existed at that particular point in time you asked me uh or at, at the start around like the evangelist role and and kind of what what does that mean and one one person in particular i, I think and I, and I know you you had them on perna virgie um she's actually who inspired me um uh, to like really pursue the evangelist path um specifically for that reason that it's not just about being a cheerleader. It's not just about being warm and likable and, and connecting. 
you also have to know what you're doing and know what you're talking about. And there's an authenticity that comes with knowledge that if you are just a likable face or you're just charming, it, you'll eventually fade away. Um, the ones that last, the ones that stay, and, and there's a reason why Purna, um, it, even though she does n really nothing in PPC anymore, is still seen as a PPC legend. She, like, she's amazing content marketing hero, high impact marketing. Everyone should, should go should go buy it. Um, she built such a strong base of authenticity from the Microsoft to the LinkedIn move that no one would ever reproach her PPC knowledge, even though she herself says, like, I'm not a PPC anymore, where there are other folks who cling to their PPC moniker, even though they haven't done PPC in years or they haven't provided helpful advice in years. So I think part of being an agency is that you are an evangelist for your clients. You have to be knowledgeable and you have to be supportive and helpful. It's, it's not just about being really, really good and that they, they keep you because they like your results and the moment they don't like your results, you, you're gone. And they don't keep you because you're just likable and, and they enjoy talking to you. Like you have to make the money. It, it needs to be both. Yeah. And I think I would say there's, there's a couple of things you can't fake and one of them is longevity. So you can't really sort of like, again, you can't survive in an industry for a long time unless you've got sort of, um, you know, something about you. Um, and again, I mean, as you say, Perna's coming on as a guest, which I'm absolutely stoked to, um, to have happen. Um, funny enough, Perna was actually put in, t in touch with me through Dave Roth, who was a guest on a previous episode. So again, it's almost like there's this kind of six degrees of separation. And as a community, we're, we're obviously a very small group of people. We all know each other. We all, we, all know, we all like each other. We all trust each other. Interestingly enough, I, I always remember um, there was a, a, a group of people and they were sort of good to bring me in. And um, they, all the people in the room basically said, you know, we all love Jim. He's great. Blah, blah, blah. And they said, have any of you actually ever worked with him before? And not one person in the room had ever done any work with me, not on the client side, agency side, but they all trusted me implicitly to know what I was doing. Because again, I mean, I, I I put myself out there, put myself on the speaking circuit. Um, again, I used to do so much more speaking. I'm, I'm actually jealous now of, I, I saw that you and Perna were both at um, Friends of Search. I did that event a few years ago. Um, loved the event, fantastic, really, really well organized, great speakers. Um, funny enough, you mentioned WordStream. Larry Kim was one of the keynotes when I was on that, that, that particular time. Uh, but again, you know, for me, I'm, I'm jealous of people that are now um, traveling around doing the speaking because I, I miss it. I think for me, it's it's something at some point in time, I, I, I remember saying to somebody, uh, I don't speak now because I'm too old, I'm too white, and I'm too male. Because I think, you know, that there is there is this um, this situation now where I think, you know, DEI has become a big, a big deal. It is a big deal, right? I mean, I looked at my podcast guest list, and I think you're the second female that I've had as a guest. It's not that I don't I don't know lots of females. I think the, the challenge I have is that you guys are always super busy speaking, traveling and whatever, difficult to get people on. So, um, so again, I'm, I'm obviously pleased to have you on here, not because you're a female, but because you are incredibly smart and, and gifted in, in your ability and in the sort of paid search arena. So for me, it was like a complete and utter no brainer to have you on. But how are so you finding that in, in terms of the, uh, the DEI and, and weaving your way around that? So, so it's interesting. Um, when I first got started in the speaking circuit, um, I had to deal with commentary uh, or like speaker comments of, oh, the speaker was hot or I got called eye candy. Um, and that was that was frustrating and that was that was really bad and, and annoying. Um, but at the same time, I took it as, all right, it's my job just to smile and nod. I think one of the things I'm very happy about with this current cohort um, is that people feel empowered to own that those sorts of things are not okay, um, that it's, it is good that folks are made to feel safe and their intelligence is, is what gets them on the stage. With all of that said, I actually do think that there's still quite a bit of work to be done in certain markets, whereas other markets are perhaps overcorrecting. So you made a, a, a really valid point that 
people should be on stage because they're smart and because they're good, not because they check certain demographic boxes. It's an incredible disservice to someone to put them on stage in front of an audience where they'll get ripped apart. Um, if they are not ready, like they don't have the content or they don't have the stage presence, like it is our job to mentor folks and to get them ready. On the flip side, it is not our job to put them on stage with a white guy that's going to hog all the attention um, and an event that's all white guys or there's like a token one person that, that's not a white guy. I mean, those those still happen. Um, but what's interesting is that the events where those still happen, those tend to be what I would call quote unquote guru events where they're all the the, the guru brands. They're not actually the actionable ones. So it's, it's funny if you if with, you look at if you analyze the speaker list historically of particular events, yeah. there'll be people that will be specifically a, a, have an affinity to a particular group. So let's let's again, I'm not going to name names, but th there will be some events where the speakers are almost always the same people, and there might be one or two additional people that kind of get added on, and that could be because they're great speakers, they put bums on seats, they sell tickets. The, you know, whatever, whatever the reason that they're there, fine. But I think, again, I think one of the, the kind of the challenges is that there is this thing, you, you know, you want to get, you know, that, that balance between, you know, um, men, and, men and women and people that are non-binary, people of color. There's so many different kind of landmines that event organizers could stand on. But equally, I think speakers have to, they, they absolutely have to um, take a, a kind of ownership of the fact that they're there not just to speak they're there to you know be, be make, make themselves available to the delegates and everything else and i've seen a lot of people right some some of some of my people some of my really really good friends in the industry i've seen them come in they present and then they just leave and they just go out the door and i'm thinking well, this is a two-day event i always make sure i go in early i'm there for the full full duration of the conference i'm there to support my my speaker cohort to any other speakers, I'll always watch this yep. session. It's not that I'm yep. I'm necessarily interested in, you know, whatever it might be, link building, PR, whatever. If it, if it's not my kind of my core competency, it doesn't matter. I'm there to support other speakers. I usually sit in the front. I will always give other speakers feedback on what they did well, what they could have improved upon, because I think that that can make a difference. And and also that then means if somebody is organizing an event and say, hey. I want a good speaker to come and you know keynote my event. I could say, well, you should talk to Perna or you could talk to Nava because I've seen you present. I know you're good at it. Whereas I think a lot of people just get picked because they're trying to make up a quota. I mean, I always, I always remember that there's a, again, it's a, it's a, I think it's actually a great concept, Shop Talk. I don't know if you've, if you've seen or heard of Shop Talk, right? But mm -hmm. Shop Talk, when they first launched, they raised a, raised a ton of money. The first event that they put on in Vegas, right? Every single person that was presenting was a CEO. So consequently, virtually all of the people that were there were older white males, because that's the demographic of typically CEOs of companies. That's, that's something completely different kind of uh, conversation to have. But what they did was they said, okay, let's completely change the, the kind of the, the bias. So they made it the following event was 100% female speakers, not one single man on, on the, um, the speaker list. So, so again, it's sort of like you go, well, are they there because they're a good subject matter expert or they're there because they're a woman and there wasn't a good subject, you know, that, that there wasn't a, so it's kind of like, you know. Well, I, I think there's an important uh, line that if you notice that everyone, that everyone is, is, is all a woman, people tend, have only started recently noticing that it's all guys so i think that's that's if you notice that it's all women that probably means that the the conference either made a point to make it all women and they, that's that's a choice and and we can debate the pros and cons but the other thing is is a subject matter so um friends of search for example i was actually very very proud that friends of search managed 50 percent female speakers that's really, really good for that part of Europe to have 50% women on stage is amazing. But the stat that maybe wasn't as great is I think it was only 10% people of color. Um, but to be fair, 
again, that the fact that it it was all like the, the, that amazing representation, it's a it's progress. Yeah. And the thing that's interesting is that I didn't notice in the speaker quality any difference between anybody. They all deserve to be there. So I think that the bigger issue is not our conferences picking and choosing based off demographics. It's how can we make talented, incredibly useful perspectives that otherwise maybe wouldn't get their chance given their shot. So I actually had a really interesting dinner um, right after SMX Munich talking about this exact issue. How, how can we empower women to lean into these opportunities? Because one of the, the complaints that conferences have, um, and I mean, even you mentioned it, is that it's hard to get women to, to present and, and, and to share. And there's, there's a consideration into what I mentioned at, at the beginning when we started talking about this of, oh, she's eye candy or, oh, like the speaker's hot. Like that, that kind of feedback is really detrimental to a first time speaker if they don't have the confidence or they're able to just let it slide off their backs. The other piece to it too is not every speaker is going to have the income or the supportive um, em em employer that will let them go and, and talk. Um, you, I had actually a, a very a, a high friction moment um, at WordStream, my very first PubCon, and I did great, and I, I got great scores, and I made a great impression at Red Speaker Enclave. So I was able to prove that I deserve to be there and that I should go. But there was actually a lot of... Um, like I was, I was yelled at <laughs> over how much it was costing for me to go to PubCon, which was the the event that launched my speaking career. Yeah. So it's it's one of those things of yes, you can absolutely have all of these things in place, but if the the places that house these speakers, whether they're women, whether they're part of the LGBTQ community, whether they're people of color, whether they're like some whatever else category um, folks find themselves in, whether it you you need to make sure that we we hold companies accountable um, for for supporting their evangelists, and that there there was a really interesting article actually um, that talked about people don't need pay raises; they need emotional raises. And I thought that that was absolute. I mean, you used some interesting language earlier but it was like bs that, that like you don't need an emotional raise you need to be paid for what you're worth but i do think that there's something that should be baked into careers and, and it's something that i fought for in in every job i've had since wordstream that it is baked into my employment contract that i will go out and speak and you will cover my expenses because i'm representing you on on the speaking circuit yeah um and i think more and more people need to advocate for that because it is a very powerful tool to be an evangelist uh, for yourself, um, that you build a brand for yourself outside of your company. Absolutely. I, I, and like I said, I, I, I've always, I, again, I don't know if it's because I grew up in Hong Kong, right, which is a multicultural, multi-diverse like, environment, right? But I've, again, I've never, ever looked at the industry and thought of the problems and the challenges that, you know, my female friends, my, my people of color friends, my, you know, all, I, I've got loads of people that are not like me and I don't, I never really thought it was an issue until, I mean, it was always there, but it was just like, I, ne I never really thought about it. So now I'm trying to be a lot more thoughtful about it being an issue. I'm trying to do it. I mean, I, again, I think, um, I, I know a lot of, um, female SEOs and and they, they come out almost like every year, almost like, like clockwork at the end of the year, there's always a top 25 SEO women. And the, the, if you look at that list, you go, well, it's fantastic. They're on the list. But most of the, um, the people that I know, they're horrified that this list even exists because they don't want there to be this comparison. There's never a top 25 men in SEO. So why should there be a top 25 women SEOs? Because they could absolutely compete. Better. They could absolutely Collective. compete. Yeah. They could absolutely compete on the same level as all of the SEOs, regardless of what gender they are. They are the top 25 SEOs and, um, you know, and, and will quite happily kick people's butts because they are 
like in that, like I said, in that top 25 on merit, not because they're a woman. I've never been a big fan of the whole, you know, top 25. I know they have the kind of PPC hero top 25, whatever it is. Again, I'm, if I ever appear on that list, I've done something wrong. So if you ever see my name on there, I've, done, I've completely failed in my mission. My mission is never to be on the receiving <laughs> end. I always want to be on the giving end, which is the, you know, which is one of the reasons why I do judging for the UK and US and so on search awards, right? I love to make sure that there's integrity in the judging process and that people that win deserve to win, right? And, um, you know, I think um, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's something that we are a long way from a solution, but I think as an industry, we need to keep trying to chip, chip away at a bit of a time and just be, be conscious of it, be, be aware of the fact that it exists and try and do something about it. But I do want to get it back on the speaking circuit, right? And I'll, you know, you you should you're it, it's we we miss you before we move on from this topic though I, I do need to give a shout out to Fred and, and to the optimizer team in general for how amazingly supportive that environment is uh, I I would not have closed down essentially my my consulting business for anyone other than Fred and Optimizer um, and and a big reason for that is just how amazingly supportive everyone is um, I had actually a really interesting debate with um, another tool uh talking about how hard it is to, to hire uh women in tech roles and i was like what are you talking about and most of our product leads and most of our engineers are women it's like well well you guys are big like that was true when we were small so it's it's not about how hard is it is are are you an environment that supports that sort of culture and I, i'm very honored and very proud to be part of optimizer which which does that's good and uh, yeah i mean like i said I've, I've been a i've been a fan and again i mean i i think it's not it's not just about what the product is i think there's more to it that goes beyond that and again i think a lot of it is as, as you just pointed out some of those things but equally you know the kind of the stuff that that Fred does in terms of giving back the PPC town halls, stuff like that, which again, it's time consuming. It's, you know, you, you can go, well, what, what does Fred get out of doing them? He's give, giving back to the community. That's been very good to him. And then a bit like me with a podcast, why am I doing it? And I want to try and help put people up on a pedestal and help give them a platform to, to talk about some of the issues and challenges that they're facing. So that as an industry, we can break them down and, and make sure that they, um, you know, clears, clears the pathway for kids, grandkids, and whatever else comes down the line from, from this point on, really. You mentioned judging, and it's actually very interesting. Um, I actually, like, I, I used to judge, and now I work at Optimizer, so I, I, I don't judge anymore because we, we enter awards. But it is really interesting seeing, uh, at least from, from when I, I would judge awards, how few people actually put effort into something that they're paying 300 400 pounds to to do it's nuts so i, I don't know if you you would all wanted to talk about that but the yeah. award season is promise <laughs> yeah i mean it's it, it, it is a difficult one i mean I, I think there are definitely some some companies and agencies that have worked out the formula right not mm -hmm. again there's no tricks no hacks it's it's a again just read what it says and answer what it asks you that's that's really Again, I, I and if don't I, use times in Roman and Ping. Yeah, um, and <laughs> equally, don't use superlatives. I was going through some some stuff recently, and everyone's like, "The results we got were fantastic and amazing, and the best we've ever seen." And it's like, well, how about you let me be the judge of that? because, um, you know, but but yeah, I mean, it's it's honestly, it's massively time consuming to to do the judging, but I absolutely love it. I've done it for quite, quite a lot of time now. Um, and I, again, I just think for me, it's, I, I just want to make sure if somebody is an award-winning agency or in-house team or whatever it might be, PPC tool, right. That they're worthy of winning it. So that's where you need to have, you know, the, the ability to be able to put forward your opinion. And if you like sway the decision towards the people that you think are the, the kind of best, which is one of the reasons why. I love the, the judging day when we get together and we talk about the, the entries and what we liked and what we didn't like. And, you know, eventually we arrive on, on the winners. So a lot of people, you know, they enter things and they're almost like they, they give them away. They're like confetti, you know, they're just thrown around like awards for anything. Um, you know, definitely if, if people win some of the awards, certainly the ones that I'm involved in, 
if you win an award, you, you absolutely deserve to get it because it's not something that is easy to get at all. Oh, thank you very much for, for your service in judging because that it, 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 I don't know if people realize how many awards typically judges have to, to read through, but it's, it's a lot. And, and just thank you very much. And invariably, I always leave until the very last minute and I'm kind of like, God, I wish <laughs> I'd started this sooner, but that's by the by. Um, so, so Nava, uh, obviously I've, I've been in, really enjoyed the conversation. Um, at, at some point in time, hopefully in the not too distant future, we'll be, get the opportunity to reconnect personally. Um, so we can, yeah. um, you know, make some bad decisions in person rather than like on here. Um, it only remains for me to say that anyone that wants to reach out to Nava, all of the information will be in the show notes, which will be available, um, somewhere on, on wherever it is you're watching, whether it's on. YouTube or Apple, Spotify, wherever it is, you grab your podcast. And if you do know anyone that, that is um, looking to get into the industry, then definitely recommend this podcast to them because the only way the industry is going to continue to evolve and grow is if we can recruit more good people into the industry. And certainly the guests that I'm trying to bring on are people that I know will help uh, fuel a, a decent career in this industry moving forward. So thank you so much for being a, a fantastic guest today. Oh, th th thank you very much for having me. Um, one little note, you mentioned that there's uh, a lot of events. One bad decision that we didn't talk about um, is people holding themselves back. If there's award winning, whether it's winning an award, whether it's speaking, whether it's joining a podcast, the worst decision you can make for yourself is not to pitch. Um, so there are some events and there are some, some opportunities that it's just who knows who, but many of them do have, uh, pitches to speak. Please, please, please consider raising your hand, getting, getting involved, um, follow the women in tech SEO group, follow the Pacers association for those opportunities, Foxwell founders. If you're curious, I'm, I'm always happy to push people in a good direction. There's also a group called, um, innovation women that's whole thing is like helping women get speaking spots they're historically all guys so sorry jim this is this is no 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 like thing. like honestly for, um, for me like and and obviously all of those um uh, what would they be called all of those groups are i'll make sure that all of the information about those is available yep. in the show notes so people can just click on the links and can go straight to them um yeah i mean i i think the um certainly the women in tech seo is a, is a phenomenal group you know, put together by a region. I think she's done a phenomenal job in pulling that group together. Um, I know, again, it's kind of like, it's weird. I, I, su I support wholeheartedly women in tech SEO. I support wholeheart, uh, the women at link unite, right. Again, because I just think they're such phenomenal initiatives. I'm not a woman, but I don't see any reason why men can't support and champion the women in the industry that they're involved in. So again, if you're that a man, so. don't go, well, I can't champion them because I'm not a woman doesn't matter you absolutely can champion them because a lot of the women in the industry may not even know of their existence so um so again it doesn't necessarily need somebody like yourself Nava, to kind of point point out to them but i appreciate you doing that for sure great well, thank you very much okay thank you for that and we'll see you on the next episode of bad decisions with jim banks